Okay, today <clears throat> we're going to start chapter three. Um, we'll do chapter three in two different videos. Um, got my green shirt on. If you've had me in other classes, you realize green's my color. I got to take this mic off for a second. But I also got my green shoes on. Huh? Like those kicks? Trying to liven up our videos a little bit here. Not sure that my color choice will accomplish that, but I'll at least point it out. Uh, and there is a charitable reason behind my choice of green shoes. I always wear green shoes on campus, and um, I'll leave a little suspense to that and perhaps come back to it in a later video. Um, so this particular chapter is going to be of interest, and this question that overlies this chapter is going to be of interest to a lot of you in this class, especially those that are Bengals fans. Um, so when I teach this particular topic in the classroom, I always ask students to begin the day, what do you think, uh, give me your impressions of Mike Brown. And that name probably brings some pretty strong emotions to some of you that are Bengals fans. And more often than not, pretty much every time, students will say things like, well, you know, he's definitely a businessman, he's in it for the business and not uh, the fans. Uh, somebody uh, earlier today in class said cheap when I asked that question. Um, but this chapter I think will give you a little bit of a perspective from an economist standpoint um, into that question of, well, how does a goal of maximizing profits influence uh, what an owner might think about the optimal win level uh, and vice versa if you're maximizing wins are you necessarily uh, maximizing profits so sports radio hosts love to talk about this question of course because it's controversial it gets callers to call in um, and a lot of times those callers if you're a person who's listening to sports radio you have perhaps heard this a lot of times those callers will say well you know if you win more games it will bring more revenue um, and that's true to some extent, um, but we're going to look at that relationship a little bit more closely here in Chapter 3. So this is another key reason why we have a sports economics class and we have a sports business program at NKU, um, because the economics here for a team owner um, are a little bit different than an owner or an executive at a regular company in a normal industry. You know, this question wouldn't apply. They don't really have wins, per se. Um, it's pretty clear that their goal is to maximize profits. Um, and that's what shareholders expect. Um, and for the most part, um, that's what we as a society accept, especially here in the United States where capitalism is become part of our country's ideals. Um, but what about you as a fan? As a sports fan, um, do you expect the owner to maximize profits at all costs? Is that your general expectation? Or do you have more of an expectation that that owner is going to try and win as many games as possible? I suspect that a lot of you, um, because you're in this class, might respect the fact that uh, an owner is trying to maximize their profits, but at the same time, especially if it's your team, you want to see uh, that team owner focused on wins. Um, and that and my mention of the sports radio debate um, kind of all revolve around this question. Are profit and winning mutually exclusive? Can you win a lot of games and is, does that maximize your profit? Or do you have to uh, pay superstars to win a lot of games and that becomes very expensive and cuts into your profits um, so are you better off not being a very successful team in terms of wins um, are you better off profit wise well let's look at uh, one of the tables there's a lot of nice tables in your textbook um, in this chapter we're going to look at a few of them here in our discussion um, but here's one that, that might support the fact that maybe profit and winning are mutually exclusive. Of course, this is a very, very small sample set from one particular league and one particular year. Um, 
and in this year uh, we see the Phillies and Yankees as sort of representing two very successful teams in baseball that year. Um, also successful in terms of attendance, um, pretty significant revenue um, in that regard, but yet their operating income, that last column to the right, uh, you see is not so great. And in the Phillies case, it's even negative. Um, despite having the most revenue of any franchise in the league that particular year. When we look at the bottom two teams, uh, Cleveland Indians, God loves Northeast Ohio, um, and the Kansas City Royals, um, not as successful on the field in this particular uh, year. Um, attendance much less, uh, almost two million less fans uh, than the Phillies and Yankees. Uh, and as you might expect, a lot less revenue as well. But look at that last column there. Operating income is great. Three times the operating income of the Yankees is what the Indians had. Um, and you might say, well, okay, Dr. Cobbs, that's because there is a missing column right here between revenue and operating income. And if that's what you were thinking, you're exactly right because there's a cost factor here, right? Um, so we know that operating income and profits um, are not a direct correlation to revenue, but are really uh, revenue uh, minus costs. Um, so let's start with this idea of maximizing profits. Um, we all know profit um, is, as I was describing, your difference between revenue and costs, um, and there's a certain revenue um, associated with winning. Uh, that revenue increases as you win games, but this happens at a decreasing rate, and we're going to talk about why in just a minute. Um, costs also increase with wins, generally. Um, you have to pay more money for better players, and better players supposedly provide you uh, with more wins. Um, now. Let's go back, uh, well, before we get to that question, let's go back to this idea of revenue increase increasing with wins but at a decreasing rate. So the argument here is that um, you will certainly earn more money as you win more games, but once you get to a win level uh, where you're making the playoffs, um, perhaps you're getting home court advantage, um, many more wins after that um, doesn't give you a lot more marginal revenue. Uh, so for instance, let's take the Golden State Warriors in the year that they uh, set the NBA record for most wins, 2015-16 um, season. So they win 73 games, you know. Those last five, six wins, you know, did that really increase their team revenue by a lot? Um, Maybe that last win did because it broke the record um, and brought a lot of publicity. Uh, but I would argue that it didn't increase revenue as much as those wins for teams at about the mid-50s level from like 52 to 57 wins, let's say, because those wins mean that your team maybe is hosting a first-round playoff series. You know, maybe you get a four seed instead of a five seed, um, which means more home games. Um, or the wins that mean that you make the playoffs instead of miss the playoffs. You know, those wins at that lower level are more valuable. Um, so essentially we're talking about diminishing returns. Um, so wins do bring greater revenue, but at a decreasing rate, diminishing returns to more and more wins. And we've seen that concept before when we were talking about offensive talent um, or adding additional talent to your team. Um, it does increase the productivity of that team from an offensive or if you're adding defense, a defensive standpoint, um, but you get diminishing returns at a certain point. So now the question um, in relation to maximizing profits. So what level of wins do we have the greatest profit, which would be the greatest difference between revenue and cost? Um, well, just like we talked about uh, in Chapter 2 when we were thinking about ticket pricing, um, that optimal point is going to be where revenue, marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Um, so the amount of money that we're making for that additional win 
is still greater than the amount of cost that that additional win um, cost us. Uh, so let's look at this on a, on a graph here. So first, we'll take a graph of the total cost and the total revenue. So on the vertical axis here, we have dollars. And on the horizontal axis, we have wins. First, let's look at total cost because it's a simple straight line here. This TC, total cost. And this is where your textbook and the authors, um, sports economists, are saying that as we move horizontally along this axis, we're getting more and more wins. And the cost of these wins is increasing at a pretty steady rate. Okay. Now contrast that to our total revenue line that has a curve to it. So as we win games down here, where we don't have very many wins, this portion of the graph, we see that the slope of this line is pretty steep here, right? The additional revenue for these wins, it's adding to our total revenue pretty significantly, right? And as we get kind of toward the midpoint here, we see this slope of this line start to sort of level off a little bit, right? And out here, we see it actually tapers down a little bit, although that's maybe an exaggeration. I don't think that additional wins come with less total revenue. Um, so this should probably be just sort of straight here, just go up a little bit. It's not a very good drawing there on my part. Um, but what happens is this idea of diminishing returns, that's what we're seeing in the curve of this total revenue line. Okay. Um, so let's get back to our question. Okay, so at what point do we have, um, let me erase some of this here, so we're not confused. There we go. Okay. So at what point is maximum revenue? There we go. Well, if we're trying, well, excuse me, maximum revenue is going to be out here, right? Our highest point on total revenue is going to be our maximum revenue. Where's our maximum profit? It's going to be right here. No, no, that's not actually going to be our maximum profit. That's going to be something else. Our maximum profit is going to be where that point is where there's the biggest gap between cost and revenue, right? And it looks to be about this point, maybe slightly lower, but we'll just use this point. So let's trace this down to the win line there. Now what's this point that I circled earlier? That's not maximum profit, that's our break-even point, right? After this point, total costs continue to increase. Our revenue doesn't increase much more. All of this is a deficit or a loss, right? Uh, so this becomes our break-even point, right? So if I was maximizing wins, but yet I didn't want to lose money, I might keep spending until I get to this point. After this, I'm losing money, right? Okay, and we can see there's a pretty big gap here between maximizing wins, but still breaking even, and maximizing profit. Now, let's look at this expressed in a slightly different way. So here we've got um, the same idea. Instead of graphing total costs and total revenue, here we're graphing the marginal cost and the marginal revenue. So we see a straight line, straight horizontal line here for marginal cost. And that's because at any level of wins, the additional cost of that additional win is the same as the additional cost of a win at another level, right? 
because this total cost line was straight all the way through any number of wins. Uh, so on this graph, where we're graphing marginal costs, we see a horizontal line. All right, so what about marginal revenue? Again, we see a drastically decreasing line. Probably shouldn't go into the negative here. I'm not so sure that winning more games out here, per se, is going to mean less revenue, per se, but we could maybe stop it somewhere around here and kind of trail it off or something like that. All right, so let's look at this. So our wins here, when we're back at this level, we don't have very many wins. Each additional win brings us a lot more marginal revenue, right? But again, as we move along the wins axis, each additional win brings us less and less additional revenue, right? That's what this marginal revenue line is showing us. Now the AC is average cost. Since the marginal cost is a horizontal line, it's the same as the average cost, right? The cost per win is the same um, in this example. Um, here we've got an average revenue line, right? Equal to demand. So average revenue, meaning at a certain level of wins, what's the average revenue for every win? And we see that this also decreases because the revenue associated with each additional win goes down as we win more games, right? So the average revenue out here, we're dividing by more wins because we've won more games, we're dividing our revenue by more wins. Uh, so that average revenue slopes down. Our profit maximizing point right here is where marginal costs is intersected with marginal revenues. And at that point, we've maximized our profits. Now, which would be the same point that we see right here, right? The second line here is where our average revenue per win crosses our average cost per win, right? That would be our break-even point, right, on this graph. Hopefully that makes sense uh, to you, seeing that represented in two different ways, and you get some idea of the difference here between maximizing profits and maximizing wins. So getting back to our, our discussion of the Cincinnati Bengals uh, that we started this chapter with, um, this maybe gives you a little bit more insight into kind of the thoughts behind the Brown family and some of the moves that they've made or lack of moves that they've made in the past and some of the criticism that they've taken. Um, you know, they would say, and they have said in interviews, hey, we're running this as a business. This is our family business. Um, most other businesses don't get criticized so much for trying to maximize profit. Um, but sports is different, um, and that's what fans want the Brown family to understand, that sports is different. Um, and so they would like to see them uh, try and maximize wins um, much more. Now, the strategy for, let's say, a family like the Browns and the NFL um, that's trying to maximize profit um, is going to be much different depending on what league your particular team is. So one strategy that might be popular in the NFL might not be the same strategy for, say, Major League Baseball. Uh, where revenues are not shared as much around the league from team excuse me from team to team and in baseball you've got a local TV contract that's a much more substantial portion of your revenue compared to the NFL where the only local TV contract is just the preseason games and not a big pot of money there um, so in general um, for teams what do you think is the most profitable league if you had to guess Well, my, I'm suspecting that most of you probably guessed uh, this correctly, the NFL. I like to think that Roger Goodell's desk in his office in New York looks something like that, made out of big wads of cash. Um, 
And here you see the median operating income um, for an NFL team at almost $30 million. Uh, I think this is in uh, early 2010s, maybe this is 2011 or 2012, something like that, uh, when the textbook was published. Um, next most, MLB, 16 million is the median, so the, mi the middle team, um, in the middle team there. And then uh, NBA and NHL we see are pretty far behind with actually a negative median operating income, so the middle team uh, was actually losing money. So over half the league's teams were losing money in terms of operating income in this particular year. Now something to keep in mind that we'll talk about later in the semester uh, when we get into labor economics and professional sports. Um, I believe that when this data was taken, um, it was right before the NBA and NHL engaged in collective bargaining. Um, and when that's about to happen, you typically see teams starting to show negative or lower operating incomes. Um, so why would collective bargaining coming up uh, make teams start to show losses or lower operating income? Any ideas there? Well, as sports fans, as you know as a sports fan, collective bargaining can often lead to long negotiations. Sometimes it leads to a lockout. Uh, or strike um, because the two, the players' association and the owners uh, that are representing the league can't agree um, to how they're going to share revenue essentially with the players. Uh, so if the NBA owners and NHL owners can go into the collective bargaining and say, "Hey, look, we're not making any money; we're losing money," um, it gives them a little bit of a bargaining chip to bring to the table to the players to say, "Hey, you need to give." us a larger share of the revenue, meaning the teams, because we're losing all this money. Um, of course, the players counteract that with, well, you know, a couple different things. You're, you own a media company and you're selling the TV rights to your media company or your TV channel at a lot lower than market value to try and make it look like your team's not making as much money, um, but your television channel's making a boatload of money, or they say, hey, you're operating at an operating loss, but the appreciation of the value of your team is going up 10, 20% every single year. Um, so you bought that team for say $400 million uh, four years ago, and now that team is worth $900 million or $800 million, which is a pretty big appreciation in value, and that's what we've seen over the last decade in terms of team values. Um, I mean, just a couple years ago, we see the Clippers sell uh, for $2 billion, um, a pretty big chunk of change. And granted, they're a large market team in L.A., but they're not even the most popular team in their own city, and they sold for $2 billion. Um, so that gives you an idea of the appreciation in team values or the, or the value of the franchise itself. Um, so let's look at another nice table uh, from the chapter. Um, this in 2011, so, so quite a few years old here, but it, I think we'll get across still the idea um, in terms of comparing two different leagues. Here we have baseball and basketball. Um, at the top here we have baseball, and you see the top three teams in terms of market value, revenue, payroll, gate revenue, and operating income. Then you see the middle two teams, then you see the bottom three teams. So you got to kind of look at it like this, as if there's like a line here and there's a bunch of teams in between where these lines are. Um, and we see the same thing for the NBA on uh, the bottom portion of this table. So what you might notice if you look closely at this is um, you know, we see a lot of crossover between market value in terms of the same clubs appearing. Uh, when we talk about market value and revenue, um, we see some of the same clubs here. When we talk about payroll, um, gate revenue, right, the Yankees show up in all of these. Uh, the Red Sox show up in all of these. Um, the Phillies um, show up here. Uh, the Dodgers, if this was a more recent table, would also show up uh, with the Yankees here in total payroll as being pretty high. Um, we see the Cubs appear a couple times here. Um, but then when we get to this last column, operating income, all of a sudden, oh, 
the Yankees disappear, the Red Sox disappear, uh, the Cubs still make our list here, um, but we actually see the Phillies show up down here in the bottom three. Um, Mets, another large market team, huge loss in this particular year, um, much larger than any of the other clubs. Um, and then basketball. Here we just saw this number just a couple minutes ago, but this negative $2 million is the median operating income um, in the NBA. So uh, we see some teams had losses much larger than that. Um, but we see a similar pattern if we look across the columns here in terms of teams. We see um, not only some of the same teams appearing, but we see the same cities in some cases that we see up here, right? We see New York teams. We see Los Angeles teams. We see Chicago teams. Um, yeah. When we get over to operating income in the NBA, we see large market still um, sort of rules here. Houston is the fourth largest market, uh, media market in the U.S. Uh, so we see these three teams come from the top four media markets um, in there. Um, Again, just like in one of our other charts, um, we see revenue here, but the missing column here is expense between these two. Here's our expense column. So if we wanted to kind of look at this as an equation, now granted there's other revenue, well we do have total revenue here as well, we would be taking our revenue minus payroll and other costs, payroll would be the biggest cost, but there's certainly other costs. Uh, operating costs, and then we could arrive at this number that's approximating their profit here, their operating income. So you see uh, the patterns here. One thing to keep in mind uh, is we see large market dominance at the top of these charts for both leagues, right? So, so why is that the case? Why do we see large market dominance? Well, the reason that a large market matters so much uh, is because we've got our total cost here line or total cost line here. Uh, looks the same as it did in our previous graph that we looked at where we were graphing total cost and total revenue. But here we've split up total revenue for large market teams and total revenue for small market teams. Now, we see they start at the same trajectory, but we see start to see a gap develop as we get more and more wins. Now, why would that be? Why would a wins at a large in a large market contribute more revenue than wins in a small market? Well, a lot of different reasons, right? So, especially in sports like baseball or basketball, where you have a large proportion of your revenue is your local TV contract, you win more games in that large market and in the small market, and your ratings go up. Um, but your ratings mean a lot more, each rating point in LA is a lot more people than each rating point in Cincinnati, right? So advertisers are willing to pay more for per rating point in LA or New York or Chicago or Houston than they are in Cincinnati or Milwaukee um, or Pittsburgh. Um, so that's one reason. Uh, another reason is, say, hey, you know, you get a winning team, maybe you're going to sell some more merchandise, right? Well, there's a lot more customers to sell to in New York and Chicago uh, than there are customers to sell to in Pittsburgh or Cincinnati or Cleveland. Um, so that's another reason for this, this gap here. Same thing with sponsorships, right? Um, in the same way that TV networks are going to pay you more in large markets for higher ratings, um, sponsors in large markets are going to pay more for sponsorships uh, than they're going to pay in small markets uh, because of the size of, this, of the fan base um, that those sponsors are reaching. So let's talk about team revenue sources. We already mentioned sponsorship. Uh, we've mentioned ticket sales. We've mentioned TV rights. right? Licensing, we mentioned. Um, other venue revenues. So We'll get into this even more in just a minute, but luxury seating um, is typically an item that's not shared amongst teams across the league, but regular seating ticket sales are shared in a larger proportion with other teams in the league. 
Concessions, you usually get to keep all your concessions for your particular stadium. If you're the team owner, you don't have to share that with other teams. Stadium naming rights, you get to keep. Uh, you don't have to share that. Um, and then the transfers from other teams in the league would be instances where uh, several leagues now have a luxury tax. It started with baseball, right, where if you go over um, a certain amount in payroll, then you pay... Uh, it used to be a 30% tax back to the league. So you sign every for every million dollars that you go over your payroll, you have to pay $300,000 in addition to that back to the league as your luxury tax, and then that those luxury taxes get divided or transferred uh, to other teams in the league. So this would be a revenue source for middle and small market teams. It would be an actual cost for those large market teams. Uh, so your total revenue equals your gate revenue plus your broadcast revenue could be local contract or national contract um, plus your licensing revenue plus your revenue from the venue plus your revenue from any sort of transfers. So we've been talking mostly about North American um, sports, primarily the US major sports in Canada. Um, I wanted to give you an idea of internationally you know what do these revenue streams look like. So here's a list um, from the same years um, 2011-2012 that we just looked at for basketball and baseball. Look at the disparity here. We have 512 there. We've got 115 at the bottom. We've got the top 20. This is the top 20 list of soccer club revenues or football as they would say in Europe. Um, let's scroll back here quickly and compare what we saw here. Um, so revenue here, the top club in baseball, let's say, 440 million about the Marlins were about 150 million as the bottom club in revenue in the entire league, right? We've got 30 teams, I believe, in Major League Baseball. Um, so they all, again, it's 2011, so about the same year. We see uh, this difference from 440 to 150. Um, we see a slightly less of a difference in the NBA. Um, now let's go forward here, back to that chart. 512 to 115. So even the worst team in Major League Baseball in terms of revenue would make this list of the top 20 football clubs. So this gives you some indication of where our franchises fall in North American leagues compared to some of the richest franchises outside of North America. We compare pretty favorably. Also it gives you some indication why some US team owners are now buying European football clubs because they realize that hey they're not necessarily maximizing revenue in the way that they could. Um, if all of our teams in our leagues are making more money um, or as much money as their top teams are making then that gives them a pretty good idea those owners that hey there's more money to be made um, in a lot of these different leagues. And the other thing to notice here is we've got a top 20 list but these aren't even from the same league right? Just in the top 10 we've got the Spanish League represented here. We've got English Premier League represented here, 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 and here. We've got the Italian League represented here. And we've got Bundesliga represented here. So four different leagues. These teams come from four different leagues. So keep in mind that there's a lot of middle and lower uh, ranked teams in terms of revenue within these different leagues. Um, that we don't even see showing up on the list. We've also got French teams here as well. Um, so that tells you there's money to be made um, in these European uh, leagues. This chart also gives you the breakdown of the sources of the revenue. So here in the dark blue you see match day, which would be their ticket sales. The light blue you see broadcasting, which is their TV dollars. And then commercial is in purple, that would be their revenue from uh, sponsorships and merchandise sales. Another chart here, so this is um, looking at league revenue, not necessarily individual club revenue, um, and it's looking at just ticket sales. Um, so if we look at attendance here, uh, we see the NFL does really well compared to other leagues, 27,000, 26,500 more. Um, in average attendance per game. Uh, Bundesliga actually finished second here, even above the English Premier League in terms of average attendance per game. 
Uh, you see Australian rules football does really well. You see our baseball does pretty well. Canadian football, that might surprise some of you, does really well. Uh, Japanese baseball league, we've got the Spanish league. Indian cricket, very well attended, 23,000. And if you scroll down here far enough, you see, hey, MLS shows up on here, right? Even ahead of NBA and NHL. Um, and this gap would be, uh, it's not very different in this particular year, but since then, MLS has continued to raise their average attendance, so that gap might be even a little bit larger. Now, of course, you're talking about less games in the MLS, you're talking about outdoor stadiums, the bigger capacity than we have in the NBA and NHL, but it gives you some indication of how much on the rise MLS uh, perhaps is. Broadcast revenue. So um, I mentioned that TV money was uh, the biggest source of revenue for the for the four major sports leagues, and we see how they've how that's changed over the last decade or so. Um, and you can easily pick out what were contract negotiation years. Right here's a contract negotiation year um, for the NHL. Right here's one in baseball. Here's the NBA's last contract negotiation. They actually renegotiated their contract um, in 2016 to start in 2017. And I think they pretty much double their TV revenue, so we would see this line go up here if we had 2017 and beyond. Um, football, you've seen it continue to go up. You see how much larger their TV contracts are than the other major leagues. Obviously, this is a contract negotiation year. What do they do here? Another contract negotiation, but also remember they're adding Thursday night games, too, to what they're selling. They used to keep it for themselves, put it on the NFL network, but those of you that are NFL fans will remember that then they sold half of the season. They sold the last eight games to, I think it's CBS, bought that contract right initially. Now they've sold the whole season, um, all 16 or 17 weeks of the NFL season, Thursday night games um, on, I think it's still CBS has that contract, I can't remember. Um, and they're simulcast on the NFL Network. So they're adding to their inventory of sales items um, to keep increasing those broadcast revenues. But they've gotten so high that now NFL teams are starting to think about, and the league itself, hey, our expansion, our biggest revenue growth at this point is probably outside of the U.S. And that's why you've seen so much effort put toward, by the North American leagues, put toward expanding the game beyond just the U.S. and Canada because they know that's where most of their revenue growth in the future is going to come from. Licensing revenue, uh, you see, again, NFL near the top here, MLB uh, rivals them. MLB, of course, has a lot more games in which to sell um, merchandise. Um, NBA does decently well. Um, NHL lags a little bit behind because of the regional nature of the sport, but still pretty well, um, getting closer and closer to a billion. Um, licensing's pretty much shared equally. There's some disparities between the leagues, you know, and how they do that. It's shared um, exactly equally in the NFL, except for the Cowboys, who have opted out of the NFL's licensing deal. So the Cowboys keep all of their own revenue from licensing, but they don't get any revenue share from any other teams. Um, so is that why Jerry Jones is so rich? Well, that's part of the reason. Um, another major reason is that in building Cowboys Stadium, uh, now AT&T Stadium, um, he was very astute in realizing that the NFL shares ticket revenue uh, pretty equally, 60-40, 60% to the home team, 40% to the visiting team, but they do not share luxury suite revenue or club seat revenue. Um, so he said, hey, let's build a lot of luxury suites so I can put those dollars in my pocket, right? Um, and then also naming rights he gets to keep as well, which in the case of the Cowboys, AT&T deal is almost $20 million a year. Um, he's really rich because of oil, but um, now he's doubly rich because of the Cowboys. Uh, so one thing that we you've maybe noticed in the NFL, you know, franchises move quite a bit more frequently than they do in the other leagues. There is movement in the other leagues, um, but historically if you're – if you know much about the history of the NFL, uh, franchises have tended to move a little bit more often, of course, most recently with the St. Louis Rams, Rams moving to L.A. Uh, so why does that happen in the NFL? Well, 
it's this idea of tragedy of the commons, right? The NFL has such revenue sharing that it kind of disincentivizes owners to, I don't want to say it disincentivizes them to stick with one market, but it tempts them to flirt with other markets with the threat that they're going to move there. And because the revenue is shared equally across the league, they can move to a smaller market and it's not really going to hurt their revenue that much because revenue shared across the league so much. Um, and that's what been one of the criticisms against the Brown family is that, well, they're not trying to make a lot of money in merchandise sales because merchandise revenue is shared equally across the league. So for the Brown family, it doesn't matter that much if you go out and buy uh, an L.A. Rams jersey versus a Cincinnati uh, Bengals jersey. Um, that money's split between all the teams. And that creates this tragedy of the commons where um, the TV revenue is going to be about the same for an owner that moves to a smaller city. Um, and the reason that that can be a tragedy is because if enough team owners do that, um, not only does it create a tragedy for the city that they're leaving, um, I experienced that growing up in Northeast Ohio and the Browns leaving town um, when I was, uh, let's see, I was in high school at the time. Um, but it also creates a problem for the league as a whole if too many owners do that because um, you're going to hurt TV ratings, right? Um, if enough owners move to smaller cities, uh, TV rating, the national ratings are going to go down somewhat, and that's going to be a, a little bit of a problem uh, once deals start coming up is if ratings start to show a decline. Um, so this tragedy of the commons is a broader term. Um, and just means overuse of a shared resource. Um, so, you know, if, again, teams are moving to smaller markets, it reduces the overall audience, which is going to affect um, the league as a whole and the popularity of the league as a whole. All right, revenue sharing. I already mentioned um, that revenues are shared in all the leagues, um, but they're shared m the most in the NFL. Um, the NBA and NHL in their latest collective bargaining agreements in, increase their revenue sharing. Um, MLB does share some of the local revenue, one-third of the local revenue in TV deals, but that means that the individual teams get to keep two-thirds of their local TV deal, which is pretty substantial in Major League Baseball, right, because they have 162 games they can sell. Uh, that's much different than in the other leagues. NBA and NHL still have pretty significant portion of games to sell locally. The NFL has basically no games to sell locally, no regular season games. Um, so they can only sell their preseason games. So what's the downside? Well, the tragedy of the commons is one downside. Um, it also means that weak teams uh, on the field might have higher profits because of the revenue sharing. We talked about that at the beginning of this discussion. Um, the most profitable teams uh, in this years that we focused on here, that the text focused on 2011, 2012, were teams that were not very strong. And you see the Bengals uh, make that list there. They were probably one of the stronger of those teams in that particular year. Um, so that leads to this question, well, with this revenue sharing, does that mean that you're taxing quality, meaning you're taxing the good teams? Um, Maybe it does. Uh, so think about this in terms of a true-false question. If all the teams are of equal quality, it doesn't matter whether they share gate receipts or not. Would that be true? So if all teams are relatively equal, should they not have revenue sharing? Um, would revenue remain unchanged? Well, that's not true. It's false um, because teams have different stadium sizes and they have different market sizes. Right, so their local TV deals are going to be of a different size, even if the teams are equal quality. Right, hopefully you realize that. So that true or false question would be false. Let's look at Premier League here. We'll kind of wrap up with this. Uh, here's the Premier League and their revenue sharing um, in that same year, just from TV income. So traditionally, international or European clubs have not shared very much revenue at all with each other. Um, European leagues have been very capitalist in their setup, whereas North American leagues have been pretty socialist in terms of revenue sharing, sharing a decent amount of revenue. But now um, those European leagues have started to move more toward our sports socialism system, uh, realizing that the disparities were getting too large. Uh, so 
this is how they split their TV income in the Premier League. You see um, they had an equal share portion. They had facility fees, meaning how much, how many games were broadcast on TV from their particular facility impacted this. So you can see just from the numbers it looks like there was several games, Chelsea, Tottenham, Arsenal, Man United, Man City had several TV games. Um, and so they got a little bit more money than these other clubs. Merit payment, see this decreases as you move down in the standings of the table. Um, so it's directly correlated to where teams finish in the league with the top team getting the most money. And then they split evenly the overseas TV money. And this, just like we were talking about with the NFL, uh, has been increasing rapidly. Um, so that leads to less disparity between the teams than what they used to have. The fact that TV income is becoming a larger and larger portion of teams' revenue. So we will pick up in the next video uh, with costs. We've focused primarily on the revenue side um, and talking about marginal revenues and marginal costs, but let's look at what those costs are specifically in our next video.